I was born in a small little village in um, Lebanon. It's called uh, Ba'lin. And this uh, village is, um, I mean, Lebanon is, is a country that is 4 million residents. So it's a very small, tiny little country in the Middle East. Yeah. And um, it's a very distinctive country from the Middle East. Lebanon is a very uh, multicultural. You've got like Christians and Muslims living um, together. Um, yeah. As well, Lebanon is also a democracy. I grew up in a village where it's like 50 minutes away from the capital. Um, and um, as I grow up, I uh, start growing taller. And so I start playing basketball and basketball was popular there. So I become a professional athlete, a professional basketball player. And then in Lebanon. Um, in Lebanon, yeah. And then um, and then, of course, I went to college. I changed my major like three times. I really didn't know what I want to do. I started with uh, radio TV, hopefully that I was uh, wanted to do some sort of filmmaking or whatever. And then um, this uh, quickly changed um, to grind. And then from there, after the after one semester of graphic design, I was like, nope, that's a lot of uh, long hours crafting and cutting paper. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. So I switched to some somewhere where it's kind of in between. I went to advertising. So there's mm -hmm. a mass communication major in my mm -hmm. undergrad. Mm -hmm. I pursued a bachelor degree um, in mass communication with concentration on advertising and marketing. I finished that by the time I was uh, scheduled for commencement, um, the war erupted in Lebanon between Lebanon and Israel. Mm. One of one of many different wars that we had um, alongside the history of these two countries. Parents are both educators. Mm. So uh, we also have a private school as a family business. Mm. My focus was more on the basketball and less on the on that degree, but I ended up with relatively good grades, and and I understood advertising. But then when the war erupted, I felt I need to leave Lebanon because this this country is doesn't is not stable. There's a lot of wars happening, and also politically, the country is far from stable. Um, and even till this day, I mean, the country is is always in turmoil. So I felt that I need to leave Lebanon and I started applying for jobs outside Lebanon. And this is how I got my first job as an uh, in an advertising agency. And then I left for Saudi. Um, and then three, four years down the line, I moved to Dubai. Uh, I worked there for another three, four years. And then I um, saved some money and I had this idea, oh, let me come back to Lebanon and take over my family school. The reason why it's a bad idea, because working with family is really tough, mm. you know, being um, because, you know, family is family. And um, and I had a lot of uh, radical ideas for the school, like I want to change everything. And my parents were like, no, 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 no. And then we ended up having conflict after conflict. But I think that the end result, after five years of working at the school, I think we I've, I've done a huge renovation project where basically I transformed the school building um, into a totally a new, completely new building. So basically I destroyed the whole thing and rebuilt it all together as, as a proper school. I went back to Saudi Arabia and I got senior level jobs um, back to my marketing career. So I got, um, I was a general manager of, uh, of an 80 person agency. And then from there, I became a CMO, chief marketing officer for a publicly listed insurance company in Saudi. And I moved to the US in May 2021. And I started uh, in fall 2021, my master's here at Cal State San Bernardino. What are some things that you really learned in your CMO position? So I started my career in an advertising agency working for clients, delivering services for clients. And uh, and throughout my career, it's all been one agency after the other. 
and I switched like three, four different agencies. So for me to move to the client side was quite a shift because now you understand, okay, how, how to speak to the board of directors, how to speak to the CEO. Now you have a different ball game of, of hierarchy and, and formalities and reporting because the agency culture is very relaxed. Uh, where the corporate culture is very structured. So yeah, it it, it was a, quite a different experience. But most importantly, I started to appreciate more the data. Um, because when you're in the creative industry, you're, you're all you care about is like how you're going to have a creative idea for your next campaign. But you're not thinking about, okay, what happened with all the customer data, the business intelligence side of things, um, especially I was in the insurance business. So there's a lot of things happening on the data side of things and the data science. I thought, well, if I pursue a master's degree in data science and I understood this data management systems thing and how to leverage data for marketing, mm -hmm. I have a, a, a chance on even progressing further in my career. And that's my thought process at the time. Mm -hmm. And that that what made me really come to the U.S. and pursue a master's in information systems with concentration on a business intelligence and data analytics. You know, I think that Lebanese in general, uh, we have a country that we like, but we cannot live in. So the culture there is more of breeding talent for export. So if you look at Lebanon as a country, um, Lebanese people, the diaspora of Lebanon is 10 times bigger than the residents of Lebanon. So mm. if you look at Lebanese all, or, all around the world, you might, you might see four, a big number. You might see 40 million people mm -hmm. there, where the people residing in Lebanon are like 4 million. Mm -hmm. So the diaspora is huge. And I think this is a culture there that, you know, and that's why probably my parents invested all of their life into educating us because they, in, my, in their mind is that, you know, this is where we have to breed the talent so that we export talent. And the only way to export talent is by providing them good education. So, mm -hmm. uh, so we are bred, I feel differently than, you know, people who are born and raised here or in Europe or whatever, because we are so, under so much pressure to be successful and to deliver and to we really do make something out of our lives. And that's a constant um, thing in our head. Not only me, like I feel that me and my sister, my brother, like all of us were really programmed to really push, push, push and be as successful as we can. I feel that the United States is a country that is open for hardworking people. And I got accepted in Cal State San Bernardino and in University of Tampa, Florida. And um, from there, it was a kind of an easy decision because uh, my cousin lives here in, in California. So I was like, okay, I have a cousin there. I just come here. He will, he will, he will orient me into the country. And he was really very helpful when I moved in here. I lived with them for like a, a month or so. I got my driving license under their supervision. I bought my own car and uh, and then I took off. I saved money uh, during my last job and I, and I came here um, paying everything from my savings. Uh, Dr. Ching impacted me a lot, especially now because I consider myself as a content creator. So I find myself using hair course material all the time, especially like Monroe's, Monroe's um, uh, laws on speech writing and, and how to create a hook and how to uh, make the people problem aware. And then, you know, all of that structure is helping me a lot as a content creator. I'm, um, I run a podcast and I understood a lot about, what makes a, um, a speech or a presentation or a content piece work because of what I learned from that course. And Dr. Condor, I, I highly respect. And 
um he, he's an awesome um dean too and uh of course he's um he's a mentor to everybody um mm. but particularly dr Tossen, he not only accepted to be my advisor but he also you know went on became a guest on my podcast and then he and then me and him had a lot of like life discussions and career discussions and 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 he's such a great motivator like every time I feel down or I feel like um you know and he he pumps me up he has a way of really you know make sure that you leave the call on a very high energy positive feeling that you can conquer the world kind of thing I was reading about AI but I always thought it's science fiction I always thought, oh, I hope it's happening in my lifetime. I hope when I'm 80 years old, oh, we can also see some machines that are capable. Mm -hmm. And um, I was in the middle of my degree last year, similar to this time last year, November 2022. I was, uh, you know, I was working on campus. I had a student assistant job on campus. And um, and I checked my email and I have a subscription for a, a tech magazine. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an online subscription, like a newsletter that comes to me every week. Flip, I think it's called. And then they announced that um, OpenAI launches chat GPT. And of course, like it was, all of this was foreign language to me. Like, what the hell is OpenAI and what the hell is chat GPT? But then I was intrigued, so I clicked. I was like, okay, this is an AI that they launched. And I was like, okay, I'm signing up. Of course, I'm interested in AI. I want to check this thing out. And it's a chat bot. Okay, I'm asking questions. Okay, it's brilliant, you know. And the more I ask and the more I interact with ChatGPT, the more like, my jaw is dropping wider. (laughs) Um, And then there are, there were people around me working on their assignments. Yeah. Uh, I remember there was this lady who was working on a paper and I was, she's also a student assistant. So I was like, Hey, what are you working on? She told me I'm working on a paper for the nuclear treaty. So I went to ChatGPT and I was like, write me a paper on nuclear treaty, just mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Then boom, boom, it um, it wrote a full paper on nuclear treaty. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this cannot be right. I have to go and check it for plagiarism, of course. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I copied that nuclear treaty paper that ChatGPT wrote and I went to a plagiarism detector and I pasted it and voila, it's original work, it says. It's all green, it's not plagiarism. And I immediately told her like, here's your paper. (laughs) And she was blown away as well. Um, Of course, I don't recommend students do their papers this way, because what are you learning? Again, remember, like my main motto is like, what are we learning? But the fact that an AI could generate original work, like this work has never been done before. It's completely developed by this brain, basically. For me, that was like a a shocking moment. That was like a aha moment that makes me feel like, oh my God, it is here. Remember I was telling you it was, I thought it's going to be science fiction for the rest of my life. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I felt that like we are interacting with an artificial intelligence right now. And I thought, okay, I need to do something about it. So I start like having all these wild ideas. A lot of them were there. A lot of the ideas I initially had right now, there are companies that are really doing exactly what I thought. Um, I had like ideas for like, okay, now we can, if if I take all the data that you generate in your life, all your social media, all your journals, all your diaries, everything, all your messages to friends and family, all your emails, if I can take all of this data and then can train a chatbot on this data 
So I can basically create a replica of you. Wow. Um, a, a digital replica that is trained on everything that you've put out on the world. Like the style of talking, the intonation, the style of writing, all of this stuff can be trained for an AI because I provided a lot of data on you, on you to them. Um, so in my head, I was like, yeah, I mean, I have to create a company and start experimenting with stuff like that. So this made me create uh, Parrot Slab LLC. And the reason why I call it parrots is first of all, like I love the the animals, like parrots are parrots are colorful and beautiful. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, what does parrots do? They mimic humans, right? They like mm -hmm. you tell them, you know, the, the parrots are famous for mimicking human voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, what does AI do? It's trying to mimic human intelligence. So this is basically the the way I put things to things together, uh, and uh, and it's a lab because I know that the company is an experimental company. I'm I'm gonna experiment with this new technology, mm -hmm. uh, and then I started at the same time doing webinars and like master classes on presentations on the internet on YouTube uh, to educate people about this technology. So um, the first few of them got a lot of views. Like I have a, um, a few presentations that got like 15,000 views uh, within a week. Mm. So um, people were hungry to learn. And I started community on, on Meetup called Singularity Syndicate, acquiring capital is kind of a chicken and egg scenario. So if you have a business idea, and you want to build it, um, you need to have something called minimal, minimal viable product, MVP. And for you to build this MVP, a lot of the times you need to even build the MVP, especially if you're a non-technical and you need a lot of technical developers and people who understand tech. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a chicken the egg. Venture capital will not give you money if you don't have MVP. And for you to make the MVP, you have to get, to get capital. Mm. And it's kind of, I felt that this is a kind of a loop, a vicious circle that will not take me anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I I put aside a lot of these ideas that I have for Parrot's Lab. And I started like going back to basics and learning how can I help clients mm -hmm. leverage this technology? So then I went into that because remember, I have a 15 years career in advertising, helping clients. So I know how to approach clients. I know how to work with clients. So I figured that the main services of Pirates Lab has to be uh, advising and consulting and, uh, you know, brainstorming solutions for clients to leverage generative AI for their business. And this was probably the second half of 2023 where I really narrowed the focus. And I figured that the best way to do it is with training um, custom uh, ChatGPT-like agents on a company's uh, products and services. Um, and, it, and this basically what I showed you in that party, you know, this chatbot that is similar to ChatGPT, but it, it learns about the company. So if you go to ChatGPT right now and ask it, oh, what's Parrot Slab? Probably doesn't know everything about my company the way I know it. Mm -hmm. So I can train, uh, I can take ChatGPT and I create like a version of it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like you're creating a copy of it for you. Mm -hmm. And then you can train it on specifically the, the products and services that you want to train. Also, you can train it to be, to reply in different ways. Like if you want it to be more uh, casual, it can become more casual. If you want it to be humorous, so it can, you know, write and, and, and entertain and mention mm -hmm. jokes and stuff like that. So basically you can tailor and custom build this chat GPT to your own um, preferences, basically. Okay. This is basically the main product that we sell at Paris Lab is 
helping clients build this kind of custom uh, chatbot that can can eventually this chatbot can replace your entire website because le- right now okay if you want to find information from csusb website let's say what you need to do is to browse and find like different pages and maybe go to the search sure. and write a keyword and then hopefully you land on the right page and then you need to read through the page to find the information you're looking for. Mm-hmm. However, if I give you a chatbot that is trained on every little information available on CSUSB website, mm-hmm. and then you can ask the chatbot, what do you want exactly? I want a major that is in the intersection of entrepreneurship and uh, marketing. Mm-hmm. And then chatbot will go and learn all of the inf- all of the majors that are that have commonalities between the two major and will tell you like you should have this major. So it's it mm-hmm. why because it 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 learns it. So my thesis was about testing the efficacy of replacing basically your traditional website with a chatbot. Have other services too, like the podcasting service. Like I can help clients set up a podcast and edit the videos and make the reels, the one minute shorts and stuff. Uh, I have uh, you know a client that I'm working with right now, and also I could do uh, CRM implementations, like these systems that help you with email marketing and building relationships with clients. So these are also other services that I provide. But the main one is the custom AI chatbots. Um, and I call them conversational websites. You know, there's no denial that uh, the United States is the most powerful country in the world. It's the land of opportunity and it's the land where ambitious people come to make great things. And I kept this in my head. And um, as soon as COVID hits and I felt that I need to pivot in my career and I have some savings, I felt that this is the natural step um, to build a new life in the US. I think I probably I'm not your typical graduate student as I came here on an older senior level career. Um, so it was more for me like an opportunity to have some time to reflect, to pivot, to strategize, to plan my next step. So mm-hmm. this two years gave me a window for me to think deeply about what my next phase of my life will be like. Mm-hmm. Um, and so CSUSB, of course, the courses are helpful. You know, you're learning with every course, you're networking with other peers, with uh, friends, and you're building social life in a new country, which is very important. Um, And I started a hiking club. So we have a full um, blown hiking group right now with more than 1000 members. Um, and then I started a chess club at Cal State. And then we also have some friends from chess. And um, and yeah, and then, you know, it's really, really, uh, I would say for all international students out there, that a degree in Cal State San Bernardino or probably any other university here in the US serves multiple directions. It provides an education that is needed, that's for sure, but also it helps you build a life in a few in a, in a foreign country, because if you go without without a school, it's really hard for you to make friends. It's really hard for you to get to know people. It's really hard for you, and even Cal State specifically, um, they are very welcoming environment. That like they are really they care about the students. They want to see you succeed. I mean, look what you're doing right now. Like, you know, you, you're, you, you, you're taking time of your day to really sit with a graduate student and, you know, write a story about them. And that is shows that Cal State is really trying and doing um, a lot for to make sure that their students are successful and are doing well. 
and that is really um, highly appreciate, appreciated. Um, so, so yeah, I feel that the university experience, although I think the media or like the general consensus right now is that, oh, you know, you don't, you don't need a degree. And, you know, you look at all these entrepreneurs who have dropped out and, you know, there's like all these non-traditional ways to get education, like on YouTube or on this, like Udemy and Coursera and all of these courses. But I think what the what what people who are advocating against universities are missing is the fact that the university is much more than just education. It's like a whole ecosystem uh, of networking, of uh, professional relationships, personal relationships, environment, extracurricular activities. All of that stuff is a university. It's not only the courses and the degree. 